Good morning, and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to be exploring something that's very elusive when it comes to its understanding, and that is autism. I know as most of our listeners are tuning in today, they probably go back to that 1988 movie by Barry Levinson simply titled Rain Man, in which Dustin Hoffman plays the autistic brother by Tom Cruise, who decides to grab him and go across country, claim him for himself, so that way he could reap the fortune that his father left for his autistic brother. Most of us see the heartwarming scenes as they try to connect over the next couple of days, and also realize some of the tragedies as Tom Cruise comes to realize this is more out of his control than he was led to believe. But you know, as sweet and endearing as that movie is and how it turns out, autism for many people who actually have direct experience with this is a lot more devastating than we were led to believe. Joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program today is a doctor who's basically going to be, as far as I'm concerned, a maverick in the field of autism to help us understand better what this is. Because in that film, it depicts that autism is perhaps something that is genetically passed from one generation to the next, and it's a psychological disorder. Well, you're going to be surprised by what you're about to hear today. The book is The Myth of Autism, and I'd like to welcome to the Beyond 50 radio program today our guest, Dr. Michael Goldberg. Dr. Goldberg, thank you for joining us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. It is an absolute pleasure to be on the show. Now, first of all, if you could, Dr. Uh, Goldberg, give us an idea of your training as well as your uh, medical experience. Well, it's interesting because it also partly ties into your great analogy of that movie. In a sense, I trained very happily at UCLA in the mid-'70s. I tell everybody through today that I trained with professors that wrote textbooks We were in a golden age of medicine. We really were understanding science. And I will never forget this. At UCLA, where I knew I wanted to become a pediatrician, I was told, and I have found out that many, many other pediatricians were told the same thing, essentially that if I saw one child with this thing called autism, in my entire lifetime in practice, that was going to be one child too many. From that statement from that rare concept presented in Rain Man, what we have now is most pediatricians have 10, a dozen or more of these children in their practice. There's probably not a family tuning in that doesn't know somebody who knows somebody who's connected. Many of the families I work with, this has been devastating to the grandparents. And I would respectfully say to all that the reason this is now different is because this is not the concept of autism that a Dr. Canner spoke about starting in the 1940s, thought about in the 50s and 60s, mm-hmm. and now is completely different in concept. Mm-hmm. Now, what's fascinating about what you talk about here in your book, The Myth of Autism, is, again, as I referred to that particular movie, it really doesn't let people who watch this know How does autism come about? We just make an assumption, if you really go back to it, that this was just something that this man was born with. And the next thing you know, that he's in a place like an asylum or a psychiatric hospital, and that's where he plans to live because of routines that need to be followed. So, you know, the audience is made to to believe or assume, anyway, that this is something that he was just born with. But as you see, and as many people are experiencing, especially for those listeners out there that have direct experience with this, that's really not the truth. At least it doesn't seem that way. Well, for many years, I have tried to rationalize that the entire medical system, literally going back to medical school, there's a split. It's like pediatrics, medicine, your doctor. And you're still a doctor, but psychiatry goes the other way. Mm -hmm. And so originally this rare disorder and many other learning disorders in children was under the realm of psychiatry. So when it first started increasing, you could understand a little bit that it was just still lumped, something called autism. But literally, as we now reach epidemic proportions, The most recent numbers are 1 in 80, and they're talking 1 in 50. 
For your listeners, for yourself, Dan, I would go back to Basic Science 101. You cannot have an epidemic of a developmental or genetic disorder, and it means whatever is occurring out there is truly a medical disease, and if we focus our efforts and resources, we could fix these children and change the outcome. Mm-hmm. Now, I know that as you approach it the way that you are suggesting, it also makes it probably a little easier with the way our American medical system is set up for people to be able to approach because there are families that are just being devastated by this due to the limitations just by the way that this is being viewed. This has been, as a pediatrician, who I can remember my training at UCLA was we were going to do a better job of helping families raise their children, good egos, good self-esteem, than our parents did in the 50s and 60s. And all of that goes out the window when, when instead of focusing on raising a child, trying to help them the normal things going through school, the parents are literally consumed with what do they do with this mysterious child and what we need to wake up, if it's an illness, then there is things to do and there's steps we can take to help these children and help these families get back to a life. Mm -hmm. Now, first of all, because your training and your experience was as a pediatrician, of course, you decided to, uh, like, which is rare to hear this, to work more on prevention <laughs> than on treatment, which was, you know, the idea is, I really don't want to be seeing you a whole lot, you know, as, the, as opposed to the way you tend to see medicine a lot of times being practiced where it becomes dependent on them coming to see you. <laughs> it's well, kind of interesting that way. But anyway, getting from that, that in that you started seeing this, uh, this rise in autism, as you said, more as an illness, as a disease. Take a look at how you explored that, what kind of conclusions or things you were able to come up with that make you approach it from this point of view? Well, for me, it really began as an evolution. I, again, I graduated medical school, wonderful training. I'm thankful to this day. Mm -hmm. I always had an issue, ironically, in ADD learning disorders, but as a physician, I was extremely uncomfortable that we really had no information. You just did something very blindly. Okay, a kid's mm -hmm. hyper, you gave him a, a stimulant med. Now, for me, as I watched children, this unfolded within my practice as a clinician. I have to almost say it happened in front of my eyes. And the starting point, believe it or not, were the parents. I used to make a joke as a pediatrician that mothers could not get ill until the children were 18. Um, fathers could fall apart. Everyone else could fall apart. But moms had to hold it together. And then mothers started coming in with sinuses, allergies, symptoms that you start relating to immune system within a very short amount of time. Started having children presenting. This actually was almost starting as I left my medical training that instead of the hyper ADD child who was bright, intelligent, the joke was you just couldn't get them in their seat, we started seeing, and you literally can watch this in the medical literature, it became quiet ADD, mixed ADD, ADD without hyperactivity, all these labels to describe this new group of children, and it was becoming apparent to me something was wrong with those children. Mm -hmm. Instead of the ADD child who, again, was bright, intelligent, you just couldn't keep them still, these kids were becoming space cadets. When they talked about quiet ADD, this is children who in class couldn't stay awake. Ironically, within my pediatric practice at the same time, this may relate to a lot of your viewers who I think are our generation. When we were growing up, the joke was, you woke up as a teenager, you burned the candle both ends, you went back to bed, and you did the same thing the next day. Remember those days, Dan? I do, yes. Now, the clue to all of this was literally in the 80s when I had children coming in for checkups. Teenagers, it was becoming accepted that teenagers were tired. 
And I, that was the start of looking at this and saying, when did it become normal for healthy children to be tired? As this began to unfold, I started attending conferences that were beginning to look at an entire new concept called neuroimmune. It began to make sense with these children, and I will say retrospectively, many of these adults who were facetiously called chronic fatigue syndrome are, as they used the term, yuppie flu. And that was actually the start of all this, Dan. To your viewers, to everybody listening in, what we're talking about with the children can be traced to the fact that the medical system made a disastrous mistake in the early 80s and decided that these adults presenting with rheumatoid symptoms, mono-like fatigue, were making it up. The yuppie flu, they were malingerers. Mm -hmm. I say to many families, if the system had tried to figure out what was wrong with those adults, the children today would be healthy. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to skip over this, Dan. When you said preventative medicine, I will come back to it any time, that I learned in medical school, thankfully with brilliant professors, it's a lot cheaper to keep a child healthy and out of that hospital than to deliver hospital care. And I believe the same thing applies to our system today. If we get back to preventative medicine, adults and children will be a lot better off. Mm -hmm. Back to as this was unfolding, I start looking. I'm a believer in nutrition. I was taught to think of allergies, remove triggers that, that stress the body. And as my wife started developing an illness that there were no answers for, I actually turned to a company that was doing work with nutritional medicine. And it was, that was the start of beginning to look towards autism because they gave me some tests from children that were quote-unquote autism. This was um, late 80s. And the peculiar thing to me was they had the same kind of markers on their findings as these adults were having and these mixed ADD children were having. Since it had come around that there must be something immune or viral going on, my first reaction was literally, what in the world does autism have to do with immune system or viruses? Mm -hmm. And shortly thereafter... A psychiatrist came in asking me to consult on his child, came in the first time with a stack of research papers about two inches, three inches thick, comes in a month later with another stack of research papers two to three inches thick, and that led to the first paper I put out there on the Internet, Autism and the Immune Connection, and almost scaringly, it was obvious that if you go back in medical literature, there were multiple cases of children or adults becoming autistic from a virus, from a brain insult, and that was the clue that not everything that we call autism is developmental or genetic. Mm -hmm. Now talk about, for instance, in your book, you talk about Dr. Kanner, okay, and then he had a particular criteria that could be considered autism. Talk about that because I found that fascinating there alone because this might shed some light on, I know, the direction that we are going with your book, The Myth of Autism, here. Well, I'm glad you brought up Dr. Canner there because I think that what I, what I hope could happen is let's go back to Dr. Canner. In essence, multiple, I would have to say very good psychiatrists, debated this new concept. Dr. Canner is credited with identifying this concept of autism in the early 40s. And there were multiple debates about how to define it, what it was, 40s, 50s, 60s. And my hope is that, that we can get a system back to what Dr. Canner literally said. Here was a man, spent years of work with this, and two criteria stand out majorly. One, as I mentioned in my book, Dr. Canner makes the point that a child with autism was never affectionate. This was part of the concept, mm -hmm. that it had to be developmental, genetic. So it's safe to say to a parent, if their child was affectionate, is affectionate, 
they do not fit a proper definition of autism. Mm -hmm. Beyond that, it turns out when you read Dr. Kanner and the literature in the 50s, 60s, he made the point not once, not twice, but literally over and over again that a child with autism was never normal. The pattern of these children today, literally over and over and over again, is the child is born, goes home, seems normal, the parents are excited, they have a new baby, and then over some period of time, one year, one and a half years, two years, this previously normal child starts to slow down in development, becomes often zonier, more withdrawn, and then starts to act as they would use the words autistic. But if you, t if you go by Dr. Kanner's criteria, 99% of these children would not fit the definition of autism, and that should be, would be the trigger for our medical system to say what is wrong with these children. They are ill. Well, here's the other thing, too, uh, Dr. Goldberg, is uh, I myself have attended, I guess you could call these autistic groups where families come together. In fact, one of the places that we were going to, it's once a month, is called a family game night. And basically these families come together with their children who are on the spectrum, as it is called, and they get to go run around and play video games and connect with each other and, and basically be, be with their peer group. And uh, what's fascinating is, to me anyway, that generally I hear this consistent story that all of a sudden it was like a light switch click happens between the ages of 8 and 12 years old that they now become like this. And I'm like, so what you're saying is that it seems to be that all children, and, and they say almost unanimously, yes, it does. But then it's all of a sudden like a switch clicked off. They were hard to manage. They isolate. They, you know, just between 8 and 12, and, and then in some cases maybe into their teen years when it clicks, and so in some cases becomes violent as far as the way they act out, and they need their rigidness and and, and I'm just astounded. I'm thinking, well, that doesn't sound like something that's genetic that just gets passed on. You know, I'm not a doctor, but it lays there dormant, and then by a specific age it decides, okay, I'm going to go ahead and kick in. Because my understanding of sickness, anyway, is that the body becomes ill because it's trying to protect itself. Now, of course, correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, I'm listening to these stories, and to me it just didn't make any sense. Well, Dan, I truly wish more people would step up and say that same thing. What we are talking about today, what we are doing today, literally makes no medical or scientific sense. I attended conferences, major researchers, late 90s, that there is no way in life you can talk about a child starting off normal, smiling, interacting, developing as a parent would expect, and then at some point going into the shutdown, literally losing that child, and mm -hmm. pretend that somehow they were born wrong to start with. You said it correctly. That makes no sense. Mm -hmm. What you have instead, and it's becoming very disturbing because I would now trace this as a physician back to the late 70s, early 80s, when we first had previously highly intelligent adults, many of them college graduates, mm -hmm. suddenly become cognitively dysfunctional, can't think right, tired, foggy, followed by these teenagers and then younger children with these ADD issues. And if you look at this, it's a progression of what could only be understood as a different kind of medical epidemic that now has reached these younger children. And the mistake we're making is the people that first thought these adults are psychosomatic continued that to the children. And yet, as I just came out, I don't know if you are aware of this, but there was a study released early February that was trying to tell these families autism isn't so bad. 10 or 20% of these children are recovering. Now, I'm hoping parents are going to come together and realize 
that is it. The same system that has told them for 50 plus years, you can't recover from autism, refuses to acknowledge that if 10 or 20 percent of children are recovering, at minimum, 10 or 20 percent of these children have a disease. And if 10 or 20 percent have a disease, how many others have a disease? <laughs> it's kind of fun when the numbers get That's big enough black. that you can start asking That's that question. <laughs> you, you have to get past it. It's, it's scary. Right. <laughs> now, I know that you, and you talk about this in your book, that you had real direct experience with this with your wife. Tell us about that. Yeah, in many ways, she makes jokes nowadays that she got sick to change my career. <laughs> and, and that may have been the trigger because, obviously, as she's getting ill, mm-hmm. I, knew, I believed her. I knew it wasn't psychosomatic, okay? Right. And I had the ability as a physician to send her to very top physicians. And they kept shaking their heads. They don't understand what's going on. They were at least honest enough to say they knew something was wrong with her. They weren't telling her she, she was psychosomatic. And finally, we never forget this, my son goes, Dad, you got to fix Mom. And that started my trek into trying to understand what this was, ultimately led to some very cutting-edge research meetings, early 80s, excuse me, late 80s, then early 90s. And that's the connection I'm trying to express to everyone Mm -hmm. as it became obvious my wife was suffering from a chronic immune, multiple viral disorder, unlike what I had been taught about in medical school, not viruses that had her in a hospital, not viruses that were openly killing her, but viruses that were low-grade causing cognitive dysfunction. This is what we should study, but I believe they're secondary to a stressed immune system, not first. And that begins to explain these children One of the other points we skipped over, when Dr. Kanner defined autism, children did not have fine or really gross motor issues. A few kids had some minor motor things, but those children, if anything, could put things together no one else could. Mm -hmm. The majority of the children presenting today with autistic symptoms have fine, sometimes gross motor issues, and is another sign these children are ill, have a disease, do not have what Dr. Kanner called autism. Mm -hmm. Now, let's talk about, first of all, kind of highlight some of the systems that are usually attributed to people who are on the spectrum here. Okay. I think the classic, you know, diagnosis of a word, autism, is put together, usually the child first, is not progressing in language. And part of autism was the failure to develop language. But many of these children actually start off talking or developing language and then shut down. That is not consistent with Dr. Kanner, but it's the focus on language. Then, and, and this is a very important point, they talk about these children not making eye contact A big criteria is they are socially withdrawn. They are not keeping up with the normal social skills. And yet, when you look at these children, most of the patients I meet, the mothers or fathers know that they've gone into a zone. If you look at their pictures, at some point they were a bright, alert child. And at another point, they're dull, zony not making the eye contact, not because they're choosing to tune out, but because they are literally in a fog. Now, in that situation, take any of us ill. How social are we? How interactive are we? So what you have is a child becoming ill, and then they meet social criteria that they're withdrawn, and that was part of autism. What was very disturbing to me, as I started working, had the privilege of working with Dr. Mena, Dr. Bruce Miller, who is a genius in adult dementias, 
I met him at a point when we were early along in our neurospec work, and he took the spec scans, explained to me how the right temporal lobe is social skills, the left temporal lobe is language, auditory processing, in the center of that area are all the higher areas that separate us as humans from lower species, and he could define these children what was giving them autistic symptoms, but admitted then this had nothing to do with any concept Dr. Canner called autism. Do you see? Right. Now, what's fascinating about this and, you know, what made it seem uh, very encouraging, now, just to go back to, again, my experience when I would go to these groups, is that you tend to find a lot of parents that have thrown their hands up in the air and they've basically accepted this is just the way it is. In a fair amount of these uh, cases, these children are pretty heavily medicated, and they're just happy that they can basically control their children or their children seem to be under control, at least more so than they were before they became medicated. Now, here was one particular story um, that it's just disturbing because this is another way to, to also look at this too because, again, as most people are viewing autism, it's from a psychological, psychiatric standpoint. Now, here was a parent who had a child that all the way up until the eighth grade seemed to be doing pretty well, very socially intelligent, and then it was by late of the freshman year just shut down, dropped out of school, and began just isolating themselves into a dark bedroom. Now, what was interesting is she decided to approach this to say, what do we do? So all of a sudden comes across someone else who had a son about the same age and says, well, I went to this particular doctor here. You know, the first thing uh, he told me to do is you need to get this child on this particular drug. And she says she did, and it was almost like night and day within one day. You know, all of a sudden he was focused on me. He was smiling, saying, I love you, but still there were these routines they had to follow, and sometimes he'd have meltdowns and lose it and so forth. So this person goes and takes their child to this doctor to be evaluated at $200 an hour. So the first hour is spent with the doctor just sitting there kind of watching, you know, this t this young teenager. And then the second appointment was supposed to be where they sit down and they talk with this doctor, just the parents themselves. And I, and I was thinking to myself, well, that's kind of ridiculous. You know, where is any real testing or anything else? I mean, here's another $200 then another $200, and generally the minimum is at least five, six, seven appointments. And, okay, and then you're going to set up a program to treat this child. And, I, and this is the shackle. And then on top of that, you know, depending on if you have health insurance, you know, what they're able to get across to be able to do, to be able to treat this child, because in many cases there are just a lot of families out there that can't afford to go this direction. So you see the shackle with this kind of surrender, or in some cases some parents have tried so many things that anything that seems to work, that seems different, is good enough. And I just see, especially at this one particular group, just a sense of resignation. It's just like, you know, go ahead and go nuts tonight. This is game night. You know, uh, it, it gives me a break. And it just breaks my heart to see this happening. And then when you put the kind of work, Dr. Goldberg, that you have out there, and say, hey, this is viral, this is part of a, a sort of a breakdown of the immune system, that this seems, or uh, to me, looks very reversible. I'm like, parents, are you ready to get in there and fight and try this again, but from a different it, approach? Dan, I am literally praying that parents are ready to do that. Mm -hmm. we, the the, what we call the NIDS parent group, and there will be information about this between a site called NIDS.net, and if they go Facebook, search NIDS. The parent group is putting together two petitions. One of those is going to be aimed at our White House. The other one's going to be aimed at the United Nations. Mm -hmm. The concept is simple. These children are ill. They do not have something developmental called autism, and we are demanding that they begin to receive the same medical and pharmaceutical priority 
that children of the 40s, 50s, and 60s got. Now, I will be up front and blunt. The odds of this are scary to me, but if it succeeds, if we get a switch that says what you're obviously and many others are seeing, these children are ill, believe me, that's going to come back to adults because sadly, and this applies to many of your listeners, just as I can argue, the medical literature supports the other side of this. The children are ill. They have a complex immune, complex viral disease. Part of my frustration, part of my anger, is I have known for 20 years now that much of what we call Alzheimer's, many adult dementias, have an immune viral component. And just think what it would mean if we started treating what we could treat. (laughs) There you go. You start putting the simplicity back into the equation and you start looking with a different direction (laughs) than you were before. What you're touching on, when I came into this, one of my shocks as a pediatrician was to realize how, when, when you're looking at an opening that says, wait a minute, maybe these kids could be helped, maybe they could really have a life, how many parents, just what you said, they had bought in to literally, as was explained to me, the loss of their child, unlike, you know, if you take Rain Man was everybody's image, when these kids can get together play games, do something, that seems really nice. But my emotions, my being upset, comes from the concept that what if people had believed that about you and me, Dan? Right. If we were born and our brains weren't working, we would have fit all of these criteria. But we would, and this is what terrifies me, most of these children are not lower IQ. Their IQs are above average or higher. Right. That's scary. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to go back. It was in 1999 that I first met Dr. Daniel Amen, And he is definitely, I would consider, to be a maverick when it comes to ADD, ADHD. Correct. And, uh, and, 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 and it was just marvelous to meet him at the time because, to me, he was just sprouting in that industry. So he was a maverick by his own right. And back in the 1970s, I was allegedly diagnosed with ADD. They put me on, I believe it was Ritalin, half a pill a day. My mother finally, after a month of that, said, you know what, screw this. You know, I'm not going to have a zombie for a child. I'll just deal with it. And, and looking back in retrospect, I don't believe I was ADD at all. I think I was just an average boy who was just had a lot more energy than most kids, probably because I was fed well, who knows, and I couldn't sit in a seat, but I always had good grades anyway, enough of that. But anyway, he was talking about ADD, and I was looking at this going, okay, if I still possibly have this, what could I do? Because I could see some things I wasn't doing as well as others, like follow through and maybe focusing on things that I need to for periods of time until they're completed. Uh, But then again, I know a lot of adults that seem normal that do that, but that being said, you know, he says, but look, you know, this is something that's treatable. It isn't something you have to live with, and here's why. And one of the things that he was talking about, and you brought it up, uh, and here's why, and I want you to really touch on this because this is what should give our listeners a lot of hope, is that he was using what was known as the SPEC scan. And at the time, he was being looked at, as he said, that the doctors in the medical community were looking at him like he was some sort of a witch doctor. Like, this is just science fiction science. This is nonsense. Now, that was back in 1999, almost two decades ago. But now, unequivocally, they've come around and realized the value of this SPECT scan. Now, let's talk about that particular scan and how it has given a lot of hope to what you were saying about autism being an immune deficiency disorder and not a psychological or psychiatric one? Well, one is, as you are touching on, the neural spec has been part of what should have changed the entire equation out there. Right. Eamon was one of the leaders with it. Thankfully, Dr. Mina is considered a world genius with it, and our data has proven over time to be extremely accurate. But the concept is that you can look at a study that locks in time how the brain is functioning. That's an insight we never had in the 70s or 80s. -hmm. Trouble is, and you touch it on this very well, 
If this worked, I met Dr. Main or Dr. Miller early 90s. I can tell you there have been multiple articles out that, that substantiate one key point. SPEC at this point is not a diagnostic. If people say it diagnoses something, they'll be, that will be fought about, okay? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. In the world literature, the amount of flow, too much, too little, correlates directly to brain function. And I have been saying for at least 12, 15 years to license any medications that we call neurotropic to treat these children, and I would say adults, and not do it with studies that tell us what we're doing. Please forgive me, Dan, when I sound this way, but it's part of the system that goes, we have a crisis, we need to fix it, but let's make sure we don't study it with anything that we didn't have in the 70s or 80s. <laughs> that's, that's, again, scary. Right. <laughs> now, talk about how, uh, you know, this, the spec scan, you know, measures or, you know, looks at brain activity. Like you said, don't look at it as something that diagnoses, but something that just kind of shows here's the brain and here's what's going on here. Right. The key was, and again, I was literally bowled over when I met Dr. Bruce Miller. He could look at a scan of these children. I will never forget this. I was at 33 scans at that time. He shuffled them like a deck of cards and could tell me mild, moderate, severe, what was working and not working. And the key thing, it was also a major insight to what you're talking about now with the ADD. Let me use that, and it really shows what a scan can do. Essentially, ADD, when I trained, was a hyperactive, hyperkinetic child. The joke was they were fine if they were in their seat. That might have been a piece of you and me along the way, okay? Mm -hmm. And essentially, the scan showed that that type of ADD child had increased blood flow in the frontal lobe of the brain and essentially a normal rest of the brain. Now, you can get into medical discussions that may be 5 or 10% of boys that have something genetic that caused that hyper, hyperness. And then what I was taught in medical school, think about this when they're offering adults out there Ritalin, I was taught by excellent professors that these children were hyperactive. Paradoxically, they calmed down when you gave them a stimulant medicine. And I will never forget this lecture. You would never give these medicines to teenagers or adults because they're habit-forming and dangerous. Mm -hmm. Now, jump ahead 20 years. We're giving out stimulant medicines to teenagers and adults like they're candy. And the reason for that is these teenagers and adults are not hyperactive. They're tired. They're spacey. We're literally using a medicine in the wrong way. We're stimulating them. And when you go to a spec scan, it shows you what's happening. Unlike that hyperactive, hyperkinetic kid, every one of the mixed or quiet ADDs has, just like the autistic, I hate that word, children, have some component of temporal lobe hypoperfusion. They, instead of everything being normal or hyper, they actually have parts of their brain underworking. And my argument with everyone is we are never getting those children to their right potential. Instead of looking at psychiatric meds to calm a child down or control them or make some temporary better focus in school, we have to get back to a medical world, a pediatric world that says children, teenagers, I'll take that to adults ultimately, are supposed to be healthy A child's going to learn in school if their brain is bright and alert, and anything else is never going to be that child's true potential. Mm -hmm. And that's why I found the spec so fascinating, as you brought this up in uh, in the book, and even going back to Dr. Daniel Amen's studies back in 1999, and you see him now today just flourishing, and he's putting out there, look, you know, this, isn't something you have to live with, this ADD, ADHD. This is something that's treatable. This is something that's reversible most of the time. Like you said, there may be some limitations on 
people who may have been born with a slight change in such a way that causes this, but for the most part, you know, people are actually seeing it reversed uh, through dietary implementation and so forth. But what I liked about the idea of the spec scan is it gives you a picture of something, and it's just like a car. You know, if you know what specific thing it is, you can usually go in there and you can change the part, preferably, and the car runs the way it's supposed to. Not that we want to think of the human body as a car, but when you've got a picture of something, when you know what it is, rather than it being elusive like it seems to be, like what I've experienced in these groups, that there's a possibility. And what I like about that is, as you were talking in the book, and this was another uh, instance um, where there was a child that was taken to do what was called neurobiofeedback treatment. Mm-hmm. And what yeah. was fascinating about what you talk about in the book is something that was said to me during the course of these treatments. And that is, uh, the, for people who may not be familiar, they hook up uh, these little computer tabs to a person's skull, and then there's a computer that sits in front of them where they play a video game, and they literally do this through their mind. Well, anyway, through this, there's a series of tests done to kind of get an idea what areas of the brain are functioning to what levels, and there are certain parameters that they fall under under what are known as normal functioning conditions in the different parts of the brain. Now, that being said, when they finally evaluate and say, okay, well, let's say it's the occipital lobe is kind of at this level, so they direct a te- or a particular, not a test, but a particular exercise that helps to strengthen and stimulate that area into working to the parameter that it's supposed to. Now, what was interesting about this is that during the course of this treatment for this child is that the, the administrating physician was saying, I'm noticing a lot of these mini seizures in here. And you talk about that in your book, about the brain and these seizures and mini seizures and the like. Uh, talk about that a little bit, please. Well, unfortunately, that has become a very disturbing part illustrated by these GANs mm-hmm. because I have the benefit. I started doing those scans early 90s, and that was before much of this alternative medicine treatment And it was before what we're going to talk about briefly, what they call these GMO grains. Mm -hmm. So I have a huge database of scans that really showed the pathology. And the pathology of this disease is decreased function temporal lobes, sometimes the frontal lobes. What started appearing with some of the alternative medicine supplements and treatments, where you started seeing other parts of the brain hyped up. I looked at that as coming from inappropriate overstimulation. But then, starting probably mid-2000s, four or five years ago, I started seeing children who had never done any alternative treatment, no supplements, no chelation, HBOT, and the brain was very hyper. Take this in a context that they're starting to report children with autism, 35, 40% seizures, when again, under Dr. Kanner, there was no significant incident of seizures. And what appears to be happening, supported by the epilepsy seizure literature, is when we consume a food, any kind of chemical, irritate our stomach, the immune system sends out messages that literally attack the brain. And I am now seeing two-year-old children that you can only relate this to food they've eaten and the brain completely hyped up and irritated. Mm -hmm. So what you're crossing into is the almost scary concept that we have been changing our food supply. Perhaps our GI tracts, our bodies can take that. And more and more children, ultimately adults, are having colic gases, rash, adults with GI issues, colitis, ileitis, and this may be what what we're creating this disorder and making it worse. We need to study this, figure it out immediately, but under the pressure that these children are ill, and if we help them, they can grow up, pay taxes, be independent, and not consigned 
to a life that's been told to everybody, as you said, unfortunately accepted by many parents, well, this is the best they can do for their child. And it all starts, unfortunately, with the misdirection that this is developmental. Mm -hmm. If we throw the switch, these children are ill, I would like to believe we would still have a medical system that would figure all these variables out and maybe help get children and adults healthy. Mm -hmm. Now, I know that in autism, I'm starting to hear this more and more now on the horizon, and it seems to be growing in momentum, and that is the uh, attachment of the idea of autism, the switch being flicked on at a particular age, and inoculations, immunizations. Now, most of what I hear out there from people, and there was even a particular celebrity that really took a lot of heat about this, directly saying that it was because of immunizations and the heavy metals such as mercury that directly caused the autistic symptoms to occur in her own child. Now, what's fascinating is that you talk about this in the book, but I don't really or so far haven't read a whole lot about heavy metals, but something that you wouldn't even think about, and that's the yep. herpes virus. Now let's talk about immunization and the correlation between that and this autistic switch being flicked on from that point of view. All right. It, it's, it's, Dan, it's very astute that you use the word switch because that was the exact word my wife used when she went from ill to well. I it remember was, that, <laughs> and how she was like, was thank you for game. pulling me out of the fog here, but right. anyway. <laughs> no, look, this, this, that's a great word, because in a sense, that's what's happening. Let me try to explain this to these children. Mm. The truth is we all have what we call this neuroimmune system. Mm. Think of yourself, your, re, your listeners, think about how they feel when they get a cold, are a flu, we feel spacey, zony, tired. But the key point is, we were designed intelligently. A cold or a flu bug does not go to the brain. So why do we feel that way? There's literally a mechanism, what we now know is called neuroimmune, that shuts down the blood flow to what happen to be the most critical areas of our brain, which is all in these temporal lobes we're talking about. Right. Now, it's really right to think about these, chi these children. They start off that bright alert child. In this case, it may not be a switch where suddenly they're dull and zony, but that does happen to some of them. Mm -hmm. They fall into this zone. Now, here's the problem. I could argue now that 30 years of research show that this is an autoimmune, neuroimmune mistake. It's a combination of stresses. The example in adults was it could be life in general, it could be trauma, it could be surgery, it could be a major illness, but some combination of stresses pushed them over the edge and this switch went off. They fell into this disorder. The children are the same way. What I see, unfortunately, the biggest single stress right now to these kids is not vaccines, it's the food. The common story is the baby is normal, they're colicky, gassy, rashy, and then they start to fall into recurrent illness, and finally they become dull. Now, the key point, you said it, why did I not focus on heavy metals? Because unfortunately, the people focusing on heavy metals seem to forget all basic science. <laughs> we, we know that metals are bad for the brain. Sure. In fact, you probably know that in the 1800s, early 1900s, mercury was part of many home remedies, mm -hmm. caused many disorders. The key point, it never caused autism. Wow. Okay. And metals have nothing to do with autistic symptoms. And that comes back to the vaccines. Part of the only rationale for why the system hasn't changed by now is instead of parents coming together, yelling like our parents did in the 40s, 50s, that children are ill, they have been misled. They're yelling about vaccines. They're yelling about mercury. And the truth is, studies have shown vaccines in no way cause this, but 
as I write about, as I talk about. If you think of this neuroimmune system as a combination of stresses, a vaccine may be part of the stress that seemed to push that kid over the edge. Mm -hmm. You back up, and my training was very heavy infectious disease. If a severe case of measles, whooping cough, any other childhood disease where a kid is literally ill in a hospital didn't cause autism, there's no way the stress of that vaccine by itself could ever do that. Mm. This has been a misdirection mm -hmm. that I think has severely hurt the parents and their children. Well, yeah, and that's why I wanted to bring that up because, you know, again, you were talking about a herpes virus, and I thought, well, now, I'm not, you know, a scientist by any weights and measures, but a herpes virus and heavy metals are really worlds apart <laughs> and um, what they are. <laughs> now, and they, go and ahead. Even supporting that, this is, this is where part of me gets very frustrated, I think, is if you go to the literature, as I said, there's plenty of proof heavy metals cannot cause autism, but there's also multiple articles where children... Our an adult got our herpes virus. Isn't it ironic? We're taught in medical school they go to the temporal lobe of the brain, and after that herpes virus, they were left autistic. Mm. Wow. Mm -hmm. So where does this come from? Well, now look, that gets okay. That gets into the much bigger picture. I think to understand this, Dan, you must go back to the fact that something started changing late 70s, early 80s. You can get into all sorts of battles, environment, ozone layer, but I think the only thing that you can say for sure is something started changing and people's immune systems started behaving differently. If you focus just on autism, it's like an isolated crisis. But if you look at the evolution, what we've touched on, start with intelligent, high-functioning adults, becoming debilitated, followed by more and more children having cognitive dysfunction that wasn't supposed to be there, wasn't discussed by researchers of the 60s, 70s, and then finally an epidemic of something that cannot be an epidemic, put it all together, and what we have is a different kind of medical epidemic, and while we can fight the next 50, 100 years about the reasons my hope is it's time to come together and treat it. Stop this epidemic and help our society get back to preventative medicine. You said it earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a lot better to stay well and not be in a hospital than be in a hospital today. Well, and even furthermore, again, when you take a look at this, uh, again, from the uh, basis of psychology, that's going to be a never-ending thing in and of itself. You know, just it'll go on and on and on. And, and but, again, you'll find parents just throwing their hands up saying, well, I guess this is just the way it is. Well, you know what gets really scary is we have a medical epidemic. I can argue that polio at its worst, when my parents were scared every spring about some, and your parents about something called polio, was 1 in 1,500 to 1 in 2,000 children. We're talking 1 in 80, 1 in 50. Who do, who do these psychologists think is going to pay for these children later? We've got to shift back to a world that gives them a chance to recover and take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. I, just, I, I just want to quote the book again here for the listeners out there. When it comes to autism, you quote, scientifically impossible for there to be a developmental epidemic. Correct. And that being yeah. said, for our listening audience, then the epidemic clearly is what? A medical disorder, what we're defining as complex neuroimmune, complex viral, and the quicker we get our medical and pharmaceutical mm -hmm. system to figure that out, the quicker we start to get both these children and I would argue many, many adults well. Okay. Now, that being said, for our listeners, is the symptoms or are the symptoms and is autism 
for the general populace who seem to be having this, is this treatable and reversible? Absolutely, at least for 99, probably 0.9 percent of those out there. My, that's my pretty encouraging because that's a lot of people. <laughs> if they don't fit what Dr. Canner said, they do not likely have a developmental disorder called autism. So here's an interesting question for you, the listeners out there who may have direct experience with someone that you may know or you may have someone yourself or you may be it. So the first question, according to the developmental approach to autism, is, is this developmental? That means that you were born with it, right? Correct. Okay, okay. I just want to be sure about that definition. So if it's developmental, that means you were born with this, okay? That's a different thing altogether. But according to Dr. Canner's criteria for autism, which what I remember from the book, he kind of compared with schizophrenia. Kind of. Correct. Okay. Kind of laid it into the same thing here. Okay. So yeah. autism, development, developmentally speaking, is like schizophrenia. Okay. So we'll just kind of put those two in a category, and they belong together over on the left side. On the right side, according to his, um, uh, I guess, label, uh, you have to have or never have had any kind of affectionate connection with people. Never. Correct. Okay. So the first question is, were you ever affectionate with anybody? Did you ever feel like hugging or just saying hi or, or saying I love you? If you've ever said that in your your entire life, then you're in the right side category, which means this is treatable and reversible. Ooh, that's pretty good it, news, I would think. So it's, if the baby was affectionate, smiled, responded to the mother's it, you know, affection, that's a normal child, not a child with autism. <laughs> okay. Very encouraging stuff for the people out there because I know there's a lot of light switches that are going on here now like, wow, okay. So for the listeners, from this point forward, what would be the first one to three steps you would suggest a person who has direct experience with this non-autistic autism to do? The first, the first step for everybody is to start to talk to their physicians, the consultants, start to bring them back to what we're saying, challenge them. According to Dr. Canner, a child was never affectionate. My child is affectionate. According to Dr. Canner, the, the child was never normal. My child was normal. My, and if a child has motor issues, so you start with each parent challenging the physician. Okay. Two, the parent starts to believe that their child has a right to a life, their child was, many mothers know this, by the way, we skipped over this, Dan, but many, many mothers know their child was normal, they lost their child. What I'm saying there is let's get back to pediatrics, and it's time that mothers believed in themselves again. I was taught in medical school, listen to the mothers, let's go back to that. And finally, I would encourage your, your listeners to look into this effort beginning. We will have these petitions out in the next couple of weeks. And if we can get enough momentum, that may be the only system left that can start to bring this pendulum mm -hmm. back to a medical direction for everybody. You know, and that's exciting. Now, just to touch on that, when the listeners out there decide to go to their doctors now, they're bumping up against to somebody who they believe is smarter than they are. And, you know, Look, you know, they're no smarter than you are, really. They may be better educated in an area than you are, but they're no smarter than you are, okay? But you I know just... what? <laughs> when you say that, Dad, I'm going to give you something that happened a year ago, and it's scary. <laughs> okay. As a doctor, there's a separation. In other words, part of this I said earlier, it's like you're a pediatrician, you're an internist, you're a medical specialist, you go one way, psychiatry goes the other, mm -hmm. Okay. Right. When I go to a pediatric conference where we're talking about top-level professors talking, and I say to them, are you aware that Dr. Canner said a child with autism was never affectionate? They looked at me and had never heard that before. <laughs> it's scary. Well, the other point I wanted to bring up, Dr. Goldberg, was this. Back in the 1980s, my mother started talking about this thing called candida. Yes. Right. Now, why this is important is this. She says, now, you know, you might want to take a look at this because 
this might be a reason why you're feeling spacey, why you don't follow through, so forth and so on. Now, this comes from a woman who didn't even finish her sophomore year of high school, okay? But I always considered my mother to be pretty intelligent for her lack of education, I think. And so she says, but I will tell you this, if you do talk to a doctor about this, here's probably what you'll hear. Well, you know, every few years, somebody out there comes up with some kind of a thing, blah, 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 and he'll just simply dismiss it as being hokey medicine. Well, you know, you actually cover it in your book, and it seems to me that, and that was back in the 1980s, that this has gained some momentum as being a viable thing to take a look at to eliminate extra yeast in the body because it's just not good for the body, you know. And now it's become sort of a, a, a thing that isn't hokey so much anymore. And it, it just astounds me that when you take a look at the scientific community, that in some cases that it takes so long when enough evidence is there for anything to gain momentum for people to finally go, okay, maybe I'll start doing this. Well, well, I think that that's been part of the frustration. I was taught that from day one in medical school, that the system is slow to change. But right now, when we talk about the things we are, when you look at the logic, the science, the medicine, the illness going on, and the system at the top won't throw that switch, this is not acceptable any longer. Mm -hmm. We have to get a switch that says the kids are ill. From that, everything good could happen. Now, as you have suggested for the listeners to go up to their doctors, and maybe in a lot of cases they're going to be going up against their doctors, what would be the proper steps to go from that point forward? Well, two things. One is, sadly, they have to be more stubborn than the physician. What I try to get parents to do is, is they really have to try to put the physician on the line that, wait a minute, if Dr. Canner said this, he said this, he said this, how can you not work my child up for some other possibility? Mm -hmm. Okay, but as I said, unfortunately, this whole thing is traceable over 30 years, Dan. Right. And if we cannot get, I've been told this by many, many people in the medical field, we have to get that momentum that goes around this obstruction, and then your listeners, many other people, will get all the help they deserve. If we don't do that, everybody's fighting a battle, but the people at the top, especially as you look at the new insurance system we're going to, it's going to be a cutting off of care, not access to care. We've got to change that. Now, you do outlay what is known as the Goldberg Method. Talk about a couple of things out of that for our listeners. Okay, this is a, a, a protocol, in a sense, or an approach that has evolved over these 30 years. Mm -hmm. The first key, and this actually goes back to good training with allergist internist. When you're talking about reactivity, somebody's reacting to something, the truth is you can't throw things in there, block the body, and think nothing's going to happen. The first key is get rid of triggers. So in the book, I talk about do's and don'ts of diet. With what they're doing, unfortunately, with these modified grains out there, it has probably become more important than ever. And one key point to any of your listeners is you do not want a baby gassy, colicky, rashy, and you don't want a child eating any food that they react to or break out to. You can't give enzymes and things to hide that. You want to take those things away. Mm -hmm. Then, based on blood work, Many of these children have a virus, and I do believe in treating with an antiviral. Mm -hmm. That alone will get many of these children starting to feel better, becoming healthier, more alert. The idea of yeast, as I explain in the book, if you make a mistake and say there's yeast in the brain or yeast in the bloodstream, I would have lost all credibility with researchers I count on, but if I'm careful... And note that in a stressed immune system, you can have an overgrowth in the GI tract that starts to interfere with the body. It doesn't cause this, mm -hmm. but it interferes with the body. Then treating it becomes justifiable. And because of the temporal lobe involvement, and I'll stress this as a pediatrician, I look at these children as I believe they are ill. That means I can do nothing to them that I wouldn't do to a regular healthy child that was ill. 
I eat. I would never give a healthy child an antipsychotic such as Risperidol, Abilify, and expect that they're going to have a healthy brain 10 years later. <laughs> no. But the system can do that because of the, mis- the wrong assumption that the brain is already damaged. Mm-hmm. So anything I do, the focus with the parents is to get, and this is what we have to get back to in medicine, a bright child. It turns out the temporal lobes are primarily serotonin mediated. So in this case, I started using, this came from originally older children, but now to the younger ones, SSRIs. These were the new kind of wonder antidepressants. But as I repeat over and over, I'm a pediatrician. I'm never going to use a medicine to regulate or control a child. You titrate the medicine The thing you look for as a marker of health, both in adults and children, is can you wake up in the morning refreshed, like the brain's actually gone into a healthy, what we call stage four REM sleep cycle. And what I start to look for, can this child become physically as alert and bright in their eyes as a healthy child? If you start to do that, the brain is beginning to work. And now you can go back and help that child learn the way they're supposed to, not with a bunch of modified techniques and something that could never come out normal. But if you get the brain working, then you have the chance to help that child correctly. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, and it's all such, it's just exciting to know that, you know, your book, The Myth of Autism, puts that out there in a way that, to me, just makes a lot of sense. It just does. You know, again, as I alluded to earlier in the show, you know, I hear the stories over and over and over. It was like at this particular age, a switch just flicked off and they disappeared into the gallows, so to speak. And I'm thinking that just doesn't make any sense that this was something then your child was born with, that it's just been lying there dormant waiting for the right chain reaction to turn it on. It just doesn't make any sense to me. I'm just a radio show host. (laughs) Dan, you are making a lot more sense than the experts trying to pretend that can happen. It really cannot. I can say this to any of your listeners. I attended multiple high-level research meetings in the 90s, and they specifically said it's impossible to think of a brain developing normally, a switch being thrown, but they were abnormal from birth. Never. Mm Mm-hmm. Well, Dr. Michael Goldberg, I'd like to thank you so much for being here on the Beyond 50 radio program. Uh, We tend to pride ourselves. uh, We've been out there now almost 10 years. We generally find ourselves anywhere from 3 to 10 years ahead of what's going on out there in the main world. And I think this is the first time, in fact, I know this is the first time that I have heard of this approach to autism. And, again, having been out there in the community and having what I would consider to be somewhat direct experience with this there is a lot of deep frustration out there but it's like you talk about in your book this was something that blindsided even the medical community they weren't trained or prepared for this and it's sort of like they're just kind of making this stuff up as they go along but you know your approach from the standpoint of taking a look and saying now this will be just my quote here as this is a super cold or a super flu, if you approach it from that standpoint, it sure gives somebody a heck of a lot more hope than saying this was a developmental thing, you know, something you were born with. Boy, that really just kind of opens up a whole lot of avenues, I think, for a lot of people out there. You are coming up with many good quotes today, Dan. I certainly hope this gets your listeners involved, and I would be welcome to talk to you again in the future. Um, I, I really thank you, and I'm hoping it's time that the world starts thinking the way you are doing right now. You better believe it, and uh, we welcome to have you back. I'm sure that will happen again, folks, so be sure to tune in to the Beyond 50 radio program as we bring back Dr. Michael Goldberg. Again, his book is The Myth of Autism. I did do a Google search on Amazon. You can be guaranteed that your average rating is five stars, which is the best. <laughs> that's pretty good so apparently what you have to say is touching a lot of people and they're starting to realize wait a minute this is a heck of a lot more empowering than i was led to believe before and usually when you're empowered you take action and dr goldberg i want to thank you for being here on the beyond 50 radio program before you go 
Do you have a website people can get more information from? Yes, I have a website, um, www.neuroimmune, N-E-U-R-O-I-M-M-U-N-E-D-R.com, and there's a parent site, www.nids, N-I-D-S dot net, N-E-T, and those sites will lead them, I hope, into good directions. Very good, and we'll certainly have hot links on our blog as well, so people will be able to have that. Again, Dr. Goldberg, thank you so much for joining uh, us here on the Beyond 50 radio program. And again, for the listeners, the book is The Myth of Autism. Thank you for being on the program today. Thank you very much for having me. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. There you go. You're armed again. Get out there and do something with the information you have, and don't just simply sit idle. And if you don't have direct experience with autism, but you know somebody who does, then you're dedicated to take this out as the messenger to be sure that they find out about this. I want to thank you again for tuning in. You've been listening to the Beyond 50 Radio program. Be sure to visit us at our website, which is beyond50radio.blogspot.com, and we'll have a nice little section for you to sign up for a free weekly e-newsletter as well. I'm Daniel Davis. This is the Beyond 50 Radio program, and remember, live your day past.